Good morning. I'm Dr. Frank Pinto, one of the partners at Connecticut Dermatology Group, um, and our topic uh, for discussion today is psoriasis. Um, psoriasis is an extremely common uh, inflammatory skin disease that affects perhaps tens of millions of people worldwide. Uh, it's one of the most common thing, uh, common rashes uh, that we see uh, here at Con Connecticut Dermatology Group, um, and most dermatologists uh, have many patients who, who suffer from psoriasis. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about psoriasis. Um, it is a, it's an inflammatory con condition. It is not an infection. It is not contagious. Um, people often are very embarrassed uh, by their psoriasis, um, or it can be quite, it can sometimes be quite uncomfortable, uh, painful, uh, or itchy. Um, psoriasis generally there are many forms of psoriasis, but the most common form is what we call psoriasis vulgaris or common psoriasis or what people would refer to as plaque psoriasis. Um, <clears throat> this, would be this would be characterized by usually well-defined, well-circumscribed red scaly patches or, or more raised plaques um, on the body. Uh, common areas of involvement would include the scalp, the elbows, the knees, uh, the hands and feet, uh, um, sometimes the, the, the groin or genital region. Um, there are other, there are other less common forms of psoriasis, including guttate psoriasis, where the lesions are usually just small bumps uh, or papules. Um, you know, pustular psoriasis, where patients can actually develop pustular, inflamed pustular lesions on the skin that can actually be, be uh, mistaken for uh, an infection. Um, patients who come in always ask, uh, where did I get psoriasis? How did I get it? Um, psoriasis really has a genetic basis for it. Um, there have been many different genes uh, identified that uh, the defects in these genes can lead to the development uh, of psoriasis. Uh, the, the type of gene defect that is present will determine many things, including uh, the severity of the psoriasis, where on the body it may be located, uh, at what age someone may develop the psoriasis, what form it will take, and maybe even how it will respond, um, how, how it responds to, to treatment. Um, we have, um, fortunately, we're in a great place right now with psoriasis. We have many treat many new, many, many treatment options for psoriasis. Um, the uh, pharmaceutical industry has invested billions of dollars uh, in the development of new psoriasis drugs. We have, we, we've had, we have new drugs coming on board all the time. Um, I thought I would just go over sort of how, <clears throat> when we see a patient with psoriasis, how we approach them from uh, the standpoint of, of evaluation and treatment. So when a patient comes in, fortunately, most of the time psoriasis is, is a clinical diagnosis. Um, uh, it's, most dermatologists can recognize uh, psoriasis pretty readily in its various forms. Um, if there's a question uh, as far as to the diagnosis or as to whether or not the, the particular rash the patient's coming in with is psoriasis, we may decide to do a skin biopsy to, to clarify that and psoriasis has a characteristic look um, on a biopsy. Um, <clears throat> one, of the things that, um, one of the things we always ask patients about who come in with psoriasis is whether or not they have joint complaints, uh, morning stiffness, joint pain, um, because um, it's estimated that anywhere from 10 to 30% of patients with psoriasis either have or will ultimately develop an a form of inflammatory arthritis called psoriatic arthritis that is similar, similar to rheumatoid arthritis. And so it's important to ask that question because some of the therapies that we prescribe often will help both the skin and the joint uh, complaints, especially the, some of the systemic drugs uh, that I'm gonna go over. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go over the, the, the treatment options for psoriasis. Um, I'm gonna sort of go in a stepwise fashion, starting with topical medications, um, moving on to some, uh, some discussion about light therapy, uh, and then into the, uh, the systemic drugs, both oral and injectable uh, systemic drugs. Um, some of the things I discussed may be considered off-label. Dermatologists frequently will uh, prescribe medications for one condition that were designed for another condition. Um, and we often, will, one, we often will mix and match. We may not use just one treatment. And we frequently will see patients coming in who are using a topical, one or more topical medications. They may be getting phototherapy, uh, light therapy, and they may be on one or sometimes two systemic drugs depending on the severity of the psoriasis. So these things are not all mutually uh, exclusive. 
Um, and failure to respond to one type of treatment does not necessarily mean that a patient's not going to respond to something else. But most of the time, we'll, depending on how severe the severity, we'll start in sort of a stepwise fashion. And topical medications, um, the, the, the sort of the, the mainstay gold standard topical medications that we've used for, for decades are topical corticosteroids. Um, these go by names such as clobetazole and triamcinolone, uh, but there are, but there are, are many others. Um, and often patients with limited uh, disease will, uh, will respond uh, very well to the use of topical steroids in a, in a cream, ointment, solution, spray or foam uh, vehicle. Um, one of the things, unfortunately, that tends to happen with topical steroids is that they, may, they will often work very well in the beginning, but then with continued use, um, their, their benefit seems to, to decrease and patients will develop a phenomenon we call tachyphylaxis, where they, the psoriasis will almost seem to develop a tolerance to topical, to topical steroids. And when that happens, we have to then move on to something else. Um, there are a few other topical medications um, that I wanted to mention. Uh, one is uh, our vitamin D analogs. These are, these are creams and ointments that are chemically related to, uh, to vitamin D. Um, I'll, mention, I'm, I'm, I'll mention in my talk some brand names because I know that's what people are familiar with. A uh, typical vitamin D analogs would be medications such as Dovinex or Taclinex or Vectical, generic name being calcipatrine or, or calcitrine. Um, the, the vitamin D analogs can be helpful for some patients, um, although some, in some cases, they, they're, some patients don't really respond very well, well to them. Uh, they have the advantage they can be used on all body areas. With topical steroids, you have to be a little careful. Um, we sometimes we have to be careful not to use a too strong a topical steroid, especially in thinner skinned regions of the body, such as the face, the neck, the underarms, the groin area, because with prolonged use, topical steroids can sometimes cause a thinning of the skin uh, or some local cutaneous side effects. Vitamin D analogs tend to not tend to not cause that. Um, a couple other topical things worth mentioning: there, there, there are another category of topical medications called topical calcineurin inhibitors. We will use these. These are um, brand names, Eladel and Protopic. These are, these are topical medications traditionally used to treat eczema, but we often will use them off-label to treat psoriasis. And again, they can be used safely on areas like the face. They don't tend to cause uh, thinning of the skin. Um, an old-time old -time remedy that uh, we still occasionally will use will be, will be derivatives of, of coal tar, including, including coal tar creams or ointments or another petroleum uh, derivative called anthralin. Um, these have been used for, for, for probably 60, or 60 years or more to treat psoriasis. And, and, in some, and, and occasionally, we will still sometimes use them. Um, they tend to be very messy and smelly, so patients often don't like them, but there still can be a place, um, especially in combination with ultraviolet light therapy, which I'll be getting to in a moment. And I just thought I would mention there is, a, again, in, in, this, in this discussion of things off-label, there is a, on the horizon, there's a new topical medication uh, called Crisoberol or, or Eucrisa that's on the verge of uh, hitting the pharmacy shelves to treat eczema. And I, can, um, and I can envision that we will probably be using this medication off-label to treat uh, psoriasis as well. So that sort of gives you an idea of what's out there in topical medications. Well, the same patient not responding to topical medications, or maybe they responded well initially, and now the, the topicals don't seem to be working well anymore, or they may have extensive parts, extensive involvement of the body, which makes application of topical medications impractical. Then we have to figure out some way to treat larger areas of the body. So the next step sort of up the therapeutic ladder is light therapy, or what we would call phototherapy. And, and today, there are two main forms of light therapy that we use. One is something called narrow band ultraviolet B phototherapy. Uh, this is administered in a booth or box that the patient, the patient will undress. Uh, we give them um, special goggles to protect their eyes from the light. Um, usually we'll cover the general region and the patient will otherwise disrobe and, and get into this booth. Um, and then they'll be treated, the entire body surface can be treated with ultraviolet B phototherapy. The narrow band that we use is a very specific wavelength of ultraviolet, of ultraviolet B that tends to have an anti-inflammatory effect on the psoriasis without giving the patient, um, without giving the patient a sunburn. Um, natural sunlight, of course, includes all spectrums of light, 
Um, this is a very narrow, very narrow spectrum of light that has been found to be most efficacious for treating uh, psoriasis. And patients typically will come in two or three times a week to get these treatments. And, and if, they're, uh, if they're persistent um, and they come on a regular basis, um, it, this can be a very effective form of therapy. Occasionally we'll have patients, and you know, of course dermatologists never uh, will recommend going to a tanning booth, but this is one instance where sometimes if patients cannot come into the office, if it's impractical for them to come into the office two or three times a week for phototherapy, um, we'll sometimes tell a patient or to go to a tanning bed a couple of times a week. Uh, it's a different type of bulb that they use in the tanning beds, but it can, it's not quite as effective as what we do in the office, but occasionally if we're really in a pinch, that's something we may also recommend. Um, the other form of light therapy that we use, which is also a form of ultraviolet B, is the eczema laser, otherwise known as the extract laser. Um, this is, a, this is a, a device that allows us to spot treat uh, directly over the patches or the plaques. So typically we'll use this, and it uses the same type of um, narrow band ultraviolet B, except in a very a very focused beam that you can hold the device right over the skin and then treat right over the affected areas. This works, this is best for patients that have relatively limited disease, uh, hands and feet, elbows and knees, scalp, um, because it's, it's, time consuming to, it's time consuming to do these treatments. But uh, for patients who um, have relatively localized disease, the extract laser also can be, can be very effective. But again, it involves a patient coming into, into the office a at least a couple of times a week. Um, so, okay, so now we have a patient who's maybe tried topical medications, maybe he's tried phototherapy, um, maybe is it really responding well enough? Um, so then we have to move into a discussion of systemic medications. And of course, patients are always, and if, as soon as we bring up systemic medications, the first question that comes up is what about side effects? Uh, all of the systemic med medications we use, unfortunately, do have potential side effects. Fortunately, most of the time, the serious side effects are relatively uncommon and manageable, and if we anticipate them and monitor for them with um, blood tests, uh, appropriate blood tests, most of the time we can, uh, we, can, um, we can manage the side effects for most of the patients. Um, so the first thing I was gonna talk about is oral medications. Um, there are four main oral medications that we currently use to treat psoriasis. The first one is a medication called methotrexate. Methotrexate has been around for decades, um, used um, traditionally in dermatology to treat psoriasis. Um, also has been used extensively by the rheumatologists uh, to treat uh, both psoriatic and rheumatoid arthritis. It's, to some extent, methotrexate has now been supplanted by some newer medications, but there is still definitely a place for methotrexate. Um, methotrexate is relatively inexpensive. Uh, patients take it on a, on a once a week basis. Um, we usually will also give them a vitamin to take called folic acid on the other days to mitigate some of the side effects. Um, side effects of methotrexate can include uh, bone marrow suppression, um, where uh, it can affect the bone marrow's ability to make blood cells. Um, it can also cause liver, sometimes cause inflammation of the liver, um, stomach upset, sometimes canker sores in the mouth. Uh, we do, obviously we do blood tests to monitor for these things. Uh, and we give patients folic acid to mitigate some of those side effects. Um, so methotrexate is, is still around. We still use it a lot. It's still a very useful drug uh, for treating psoriasis. And sometimes we, we, can, we will combine methotrexate with some of the newer biologic medications that I'll, that I'll mention shortly. Um, the next uh, oral drug is a drug called psoriatane, brand name psoriatane, generic name acetretin. Um, acetretin is an, oral, is an oral retinoid, meaning it's, it's chemically related to vitamin A. Um, again, acetretin has been around for probably 20 or 30 years. Um, we find that, that acetretin as a single, single treatment by itself um, is not always, it doesn't always work that well, except in certain instances. Patients who have uh, psoriasis on the hands and feet, especially if it's of the pustular variety, tend to respond well to acetretin. Uh, the other uh, scenario where we use acetretin is, is combined with a narrowband ultraviolet B phototherapy or extract laser. There seems to be a synergy between the retinoid acetretin and the ultraviolet light. So it can often sort of uh, augment or improve the response to ultraviolet light. So acetretin is a drug, again, that we still, um, we still do use, um, but um, it, it, it's, you know, 
relatively, relatively limited use uh, right now. <clears throat> The next drug I'll mention is a drug called cyclosporin A. This is a drug again that's been around for probably you know 30 years or more. Um, this is a, this is what's called an immunosuppressive drug. This is a type of drug that they would give a patient after an organ transplant to prevent transplant rejection. So it's a strong drug. This is a drug that sort of we consider sort of um, what we would consider sort of crisis management drug. A patient comes in, they're really in bad shape, extensive psoriasis on the body, very uncomfortable. Need to get need to do something quickly to kind of get uh, you know uh, get a handle on things and so often short term we will use cyclosporin uh, to, cyclosporin to do that um, cyclosporin can can sometimes cause problems with the kidneys uh, or with high blood pressure uh, elevation of the blood pressure these are things that we have to monitor um, and again we try to keep patients with we if we use cyclosporin we try to you know try to do it for a limited period of time. Um, and then gradually taper the patient off the drug um, while we're trying to get other things, uh, maybe, maybe other things going. Um, but cyclosporin is still a useful drug, and again, like I said, we use it often as a you know a crisis management, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, get con get control of things. Um, the last oral drug I'll mention is a new drug, um, relatively new drug called Otesla, um, that was uh, approved uh, by the FDA for treating psoriasis. I think maybe close to two years ago now. Um, this drug inhibits an enzyme. I, I won't get too technical with, with, the, with the biochemistry here, but it inhibits an enzyme called PDE4 or phosphodiesterase 4, which seems to be involved in the inflammatory process that causes psoriasis. So Otesla inhibits that enzyme, and by that mechanism seems to improve psoriasis. Otesla is also approved uh, to, treat psori to treat psoriatic arthritis. Again, it's an oral drug that's taken twice a day. Um, the main limitations to Otesla, Otesla um, does not necessarily require any, any blood test monitoring. It seems to be pretty easy on the blood, the liver, the kidneys. Um, some patients, uh, not infrequently, patients who take Otesla, however, will complain of some gastrointestinal uh, distress, uh, uh, you know, upset stomach, uh, cramps, uh, nausea, diarrhea, things like that. And that can sometimes limit uh, limit its use. Um, I would say that Otesla is probably um, about equally equivalent, e equally um, efficacious as methotrexate, but probably not as good as some of the injectable medications that we're going to um, discuss next. So then that brings us to probably the newest thing, and most of where most of the research in psoriasis treatment now is going into what are called bio is what are called biologics. Um, these are com complex. Um, mono molecules, usually monoclonal antibodies, um, that attack certain uh, what are called cytokines. In the, that, these are small proteins made by our immune cells that modulate our immune response and and, inf and inflammation. And in certain cases, we have may have over overabundance of some of these cytokines, or or uh, or our cells may be overly sensitive to them. And the various biologic drugs go after those particular um, cytokines and inhibit them uh, to try to to try to cut down on the inappropriate degree of inflammation that's going on in the body that, that's causing the psoriasis in the first place. So there's there's three main categories of biologics that I'll that I'll mention. <clears throat> the first and the, the ones that have been around the, the longest are what are called the anti TNF drugs, TNF or tumor necrosis factor, TNF alpha is a a, again, one of these cytokines that's been shown to um, modulate inflammation and patients who have psoriasis have often been found to have elevated levels of TNF or oversensitivity to its effects. Um, so the first one of these drugs that, um, that came around probably in the early 2000s was, was Embrel or Etanercept. We still use, we still, this is a drug we still use. Um, it's very effective. It's a sh it's given. Most of these biologics, uh, by the way, are given by an, an injection, either a pre-filled syringe or an auto-injectable pen. So they're they're very um, e actually easy for the patients. The patients can a patient can be shown how to do this. It's very quite very easy. Some patients have a bit of a phobia about needles. We have to sort of get them over that. Um, but the, the injections are really not very painful and very easy to do. Most of these are auto in, in, auto, are in an auto injector pen that's held up against the skin. A button is depressed with the thumb, and, and psh, it shoots the drug right in. Right in. Um, <clears throat> Embrel is typically given um, once or twice a week. Um, uh, again, all of these drugs 
do have effects on the immune system. And so in theory, uh, all of the biologics um, can possibly increase people's susceptibility to certain types of infections. Um, uh, one of the ones that we, the ones that we particularly concern ourselves with are tuberculosis and hepatitis B. And so we always screen patients for, um, for uh, latent, what we call latent tuberculosis or hidden tuberculosis, and also for um, hepatitis B before we start treating them. We also do, a, we also standardly will do a uh, tuberculosis test once a year on all the patients who are on biologics. <clears throat> the biologics in general, again, tend to be easy on the organs, uh, tend to not suppress the bone marrow, tend to be easy on the liver, the kidneys, um, but there is this theoretical increased risk of getting infections, and that's something that we have to monitor patients for. The other thing is whether or not the, by inhibiting some of these cytokines with biologics, whether we might be increasing patients' chances of getting certain types of cancer, particularly lymphoma uh, or leukemia. Fortunately, the, long, with the, the longer these drugs are around, they're collecting more, able to collect more data, uh, and we're finding that there just does not seem to be um, the, the anticipated increased risk in the number of cancers in these biologic treated patients does not really seem to be elevated over the general population. So that's very encouraging. So these drugs, especially Embrel uh, and Jumeirah that I'm, I'm gonna mention, these drugs have been around now for you know, over 15 years um, and they, they've developed a very, good, a very good track record, a very good safety record. Um, so, that, so the next anti-TNF drug is Humira or Adalimumab. Again, Humira has been around for quite a while, treat, treatment for um, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, a drug that's used for multiple disease states. Um, and again, Humira is uh, easily administered. Um, again, typically we give the patient a loading dose to uh, a loading dose the first week or so to start them, and then the patient will give themselves an injection, usually in the thigh or the abdomen, uh, once every two weeks. Um, so Humira, and Humira is, 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 uh, Humira is highly effective. Uh, a, a large number of patients in the studies um, improved, their psoriasis improved by 75% versus placebo. So Humira is a, still a very useful um, and uh, very effective drug. Um, one other TNF drug I'll mention, we don't use much in dermatology, is called Remicade or Infliximab. This is another drug that, that's been around for, uh, for, for you know, at least 15 years or more. Um, the reason we don't use, use Remicade very often is because it has to be given intravenously. And most dermatologists don't have the wherewithal, don't have the setup to do IV infusions in their office. So, but occasionally we'll have patients who are seeing a, rheum a rheumatologist. The rheumato a lot of the rheumatologists actually will do IV infusions in their office. And some of the patients that we have share with rheumatology that have both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis often will be on Remicade, uh, or patients who are on who have Crohn's disease may be on Remicade. So we have patients who are on this drug, but most dermatologists do not administer uh, Remicade because it needs to be IV. But Remicade is another drug that can be sort of used as a crisis management drug, uh, as someone who's really who's in really bad shape. And on rare occasions, we have referred patients to an infusion center. Um, to get Remicade, but, um, but typically with the TNF drugs, we're typically using the Humira and Embrel, which are administered by subcutaneous injection at home by the patient. Um, <clears throat> the next category of biologics I'll mention is, is a drug called Stellara or Ustekinumab. Um, so Stellara, again, getting into this alphabet soup of cytokines, the, the two cytokines in particular that, that Stellara targets are IL, which is, stands for interleukin, IL-12 and 23, which again, these have been shown um, to participate in the inflammatory cascade that tends to lead to developing psoriasis. Um, Stellara among the biologics is the only one that we actually administer in the office. Uh, it comes in a pre-filled syringe, either 45 or 90 milligrams, depending on the patient's weight. Patients over 220 pounds or, 200, or 100 kilograms get the higher dose. Um, we typically will give the patient the first injection on day zero, then a booster injection at four weeks, and then they come only once every 12 weeks or once every three months thereafter. So for patients who are busy, uh, a lot of patients like Stellara because once, they, once they're on it, they're only, we're only, they're only coming in for a follow-up and an injection once every three months. And again, Stellara, Stellara is, is very highly effective for psoriasis, has been approved also for psoriatic arthritis, but probably not maybe not quite as effective for psoriatic arthritis as, um, as, uh, as it is for the psoriasis. 
The last and the newest category of biologic medications are the anti-IL-17. Again, inter IL standing for interleukin. IL-17 is the new darling on the block. That's the late, that seems to be the latest thing that the researchers are going after that um, really seems to be heavily involved in the inflammatory cascade that contributes to developing psoriasis. And so we now have two, um, in the past um, year and a half or so, we've had two new drugs uh, introduced that are IL-17 inhibitors. Um, one is called Cosentix or Secukinumab, um, and the other one is called TALTS or, or Ixikizumab. And this UMAB, when you see this, these, this nomenclature, you see this UMAB um, on, the, on the end of all these biologic drugs, that's, that indicates that it's a monoclonal, human-derived monoclonal antibody. So the so the, the, these crazy sounding names actually have, there's some, there's some uh, rhyme or reason to them. Um, but Cosentix and Taltz, uh, again, both administered by subcutaneous injection. Um, both the, the, the clinical trials are just really impressive. Uh, now, we're in, now instead of talking about 75% improvement of symptoms, we're now talking about 90% improvement. And with both of these drugs, a significant, a statistically significant number of patients are getting 90% better with the drug compared to placebo. So these drugs are very impressive. And little by little, um, we're starting to move patients more into the IL-17 inhibitors. Again, just like with anything else, um, you know, with systemic therapy and psoriasis, if someone's not responding adequately to an oral drug, let's say, we might try a different oral drug or we might try a biologic. Well, by the same token, not everybody responds well to TNF blockers like Embrel or Humira. In that particular patient, that may not be the thing, the particular thing that's driving their psoriasis. So we move, so we move on to, you know, we, we pick another cytokine to inhibit, and hopefully that that will work better. So, um, so I think Cosentix and Taltz, little by little, are going to be starting to supplant some of the older drugs. Um, the one thing that uh, the one the signal that uh, we're keeping an eye on with the IL-17 drugs is that there, there's some concern that these drugs may contribute to the development of inflammatory bowel disease. So that's one of the things that we're sort of you know, keeping an eye on that sort of separates them out from the earlier drugs. So, um, but I, I think you'll, we'll be seeing more and more patients um, on these new drugs. And in fact, later this year, there's another drug called uh, brodalumab that's in the pipeline uh, to possibly be uh, approved later this year. That's another IL-17 inhibitor. The thing that's hold, held up the approval of brodalumab is that there were uh, some, a few patients in the clinical trials that committed suicide. And so that kind of put the brakes on brodalumab. But uh, from what I've most recently read, that drug is probably pretty soon to be, um, to be brought online as well. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, we've got lots of, um, you know, not lots of new things. So patients are always coming in asking what's new for psoriasis. And unfortunately, a lot of people want to know if there's a new topical medication because they don't want to necessarily be on a systemic medication. Unfortunately, there probably hasn't been a, no a new um, novel topical medication um, you know, for psoriasis in almost 20 years. Um, topical therapy just doesn't seem to be where it's at at this point for psoriasis. And all the research money is going into these systemic drugs because some of them are just so highly effective. You can really, it can really be a life change, a game changer for a patient that's been suffering for many years with psoriasis. And I, I tell people there's really, in this day and age, at least in our, in, here in the United States, where we fortunately have access to these drugs, there's really no reason for someone to, uh, to suffer with psoriasis. Um, and because even, even if there's uh, financial or insurance issues, these biologic drugs are very expensive, uh, but the companies uh, have programs in place and they will bend over backwards to get drug for patients, even, even if it's uh, not covered by insurance or if it's not affordable. So there's really no reason for anyone to, be, to, to suffer. Uh, so if you have psoriasis, I would encourage you to come see us or see your dermatologist um, as soon as possible and to discuss um, some, of these, some of these options.